Good morning. Good to see you. Thank you for your kind welcome there. For those of you who are like maybe started coming the last few weeks, um, I used to be the teaching pastor here. Uh, I don't know, maybe technically I still am. I don't even know. So whatever Ron calls me, but I'm glad to be here. Uh, I, uh, and thanks for the, for the warm welcome. Uh, so thank you. I miss you too. So you're very kind. You're very kind. So um, I'm going to talk today about... Uh, well, I'll tell you the title, but it's going to be called about communicating good news in bad times. But I'll get to that in just a little bit. I'm going to start by telling you a story uh, about how some people who call themselves Christians do a really poor job of representing Jesus. And this story is kind of a doozy, so I want you to be ready for this story. Um, you've probably seen them on television. Let me put them up here, see if you recognize some of these people. Uh, anybody seen these people like on television protesting things of that sort called Westboro? I see hands, okay, okay, about half of people. If you're, a little, if you're younger, less so. Uh, so these people are protesters from something called Westboro Baptist Church. And they show up at funerals of soldiers, in this case, or uh, well, there's all kinds of horrible. These are like the least horrible of their signs, and there's all kinds of horrible signs that they put up there. Matter of fact, we'll take that picture down so we don't have to look at that any longer. But, but what I want you to, to see is, um, is, is, is that this is, these are a group of people who I've encountered. I'll share with you in just a minute. Uh, again, they're called Westboro Baptist Church. Now, Westboro is a community in Kansas, and Westboro has disowned and disavowed any connection to these people. Uh, Baptists disown and disavow any connection to these people. And Jesus said he built his church. I'm pretty sure Jesus doesn't have any connection with these people. So, so let's call them the, the non-Westboro, non-Baptist, non-church. How's that? Is that okay? So we'll just call them that for, for now. So, um, so they are very well known. Actually, you could Google their name. It's all over the place. There's a Wikipedia article about them. It's all kinds of stuff like this. Um, so let me tell you about my encounter with them. So I was the interim pastor of a church in Nashville, Tennessee, when I was at Lifeway. You remember Lifeway? There used to be Lifeway bookstores. Anybody been to a Lifeway bookstore? Yeah, you missed those? Yeah, it's because you shopped at Amazon. But that's another story for another day. Not you personally, but me too. So all right, so they're gone now. But I was at Lifeway at the time, and I was the interim pastor of a church right across the street from the Op Opryland Hotel in Nashville. You've probably driven by the church. So the, uh, the people from the Westboro non-church were there, and they were protesting something else, and then they sent a press release out, and they said, we're going to protest at the church across the street from Opryland. I have no idea if they knew who we were. Uh, I, I was preaching on God's love that Sunday, and they are opposed to God's love. You saw the sign, God hates, you know, so, so I... Um, so we get this, this uh, information, the news stations start calling us because they, they fax all the news stations. They're always, they're always trying to get on the cameras, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of their thing. Now, mind you, there's like a couple dozen of them. It's like, like and they're all, mostly all related. They're mostly all lawyers, so they love suing people. Um, and so, so they, anyway, so they say they're going to come protest at the church where I'm serving. So we got ready for them. So we were, uh, you know, they, they were going to come out and protest, and we met them uh, it, well, here's what we did. We, we got tables and donuts and coffee and welcomed them to the front of our church and told them about this savior named Jesus. Now, now mind you, they did not like that. They were mad that we didn't respond the way they wanted us to respond. We chose to respond by showing and sharing the love of Jesus. So the, uh, the, the, the leader of this group is called Fred Phelps. He died a few years ago. And then the co-leader is his wife. Um, and so his wife called me a name uh, and it got in the news. So his wife called me a lying whore false prophet. Now, some of you are a little surprised that I said the word whore in church. So I want you to know that I did ask Pastor Ron if I could say that word. And he said, it's in the Bible? I said, it's in the Bible 34 times. He said, then it's okay to use the word. So, um, so, but you may be a little bit surprised to know that I was called in, and it made the news, I uh, was called a lying whore false prophet uh, because I believe that God loves people and that's what they said. So, you know, this is, a, I'm a lying whore false prophet. So, um, so I must admit, and this is the mischievous side of me, I did update all of my social media bios to lying whore false prophet at that point. So, and I put a link to explain it that was there. So, so, um, but one of my staff at Lifeway was, uh, she's a clever person, name's Lizette, and so she decided to, uh, well, let me just tell you, what she ended up doing, I ended up using as my 
Well, if you've ever been to my office at Wheaton College, I was at Wheaton College for seven years. I ran the Billy Graham Center there. If you came into my office at Wheaton College, maybe you'd come. I know I gave some of you a tour of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center when I was there. But if you came into my office, this is the nameplate that greeted you when you did. You can see my business cards here. You can, this is actually my desk. It needs a little cleaning. There's a picture of me with my family. You just see my little glasses there. But, but these are my business cards. And so, 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 so this is the nameplate on my desk for seven years at Wheaton College. And so every time somebody would come in, there would always be a conversation. Now, because at that time, most people, maybe 75%, 80% of people knew who these, the, the non-Westboro, non-Baptist, non-church people were, it just created a quick chuckle. Sometimes I have to do a little bit of an explanation. But what, what happened is, is when I came to Biola University, I've recently moved to California, I'm now the dean of the Talbot School of Theology, we actually have a lot more international students there. And so they came into my office far too many times and were just kind of sh shocked and stunned that I had this nameplate. So I have since, it is no longer on my desk. It is no longer on my desk. But I wanted to share it with you because we're going to talk today about how we are to represent Jesus and his kingdom in the world. We generally learn in one of two ways. By imitation, do like this. Or by distinction, don't do this. So Westboro is an example of learning by contrast. Don't do this. Where Paul, on the other hand, in Colossians chapter 4, he's going to show us to learn by imitation. Do do this like I'm doing this. And if you want a summer of rest, this, this message can like apply in so many ways in your life. I'm going to talk about the words we use and how we use those words. And so if you learn some of the lessons I have for you today, and you're married, this is going to strengthen your marriage. It's going to strengthen your workplace relationships. It's going to strengthen your family relationships. It's going to uh, strengthen your online interaction. Because all the ways that we speak and communicate, right, all the ways we speak and communicate, if those are being aligned with the teachings of Scripture and the Word of God, not misunderstanding or engaging poorly. Well, let's take a look, right? I want you to have a summer of rest, but I want you to learn this now because the summer of rest, we're actually going into a fall election season. So we, and we, we, we feel the tension already. We prayed about that some already. We feel the tension already around that. Uh, I don't know what the future holds, but, but I got to tell you, it looks like it's getting more and more divided in our nation and more. And so how will Christians speak and show and share the love of Jesus. And I think Colossians chapter four gives us some wisdom for that. If you don't have a Bible, just you can reach in the seat in front of you, one of ours, it's on page 985, it's Colossians chapter four. The title of my message today is Communicating Good News in Bad Times. Communicating Good News in Bad Times. Colossians chapter four, verses two through six is our text. Let's take a look at it together. It says this. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it, with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us so that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech, notice how I ought to speak, now let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So how are you going to use your mouth? And by your mouth, I don't just mean, I mean, you know, 2000 years ago when they talked about speech, most people couldn't write and they certainly couldn't post online. But for us, it's all of those things. How are you going to use your words? I'm going to give you four things that I think will help you to engage others with a Jesus and rest filled summer, and then even into a divided fall and beyond. So four things, you ready for four things? If you have notes, if you're a note taker, you can jot these down. Number one, is it begins with speaking to God with gratitude. Speaking to God with gratitude. This is Colossians 4.2, which says, continue steadfastly in prayer, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So some key things, right? Continue steadfastly speaks about our devotion to it. Now, mind you, you know where this is going. You know that this is going to talk about how Paul wants to speak and how he thinks Christians should speak, but it's worth noting that it begins with prayer. It begins with continue steadfastly devotion. Prayer comes first. Our first response is to pray, not to react. Listen, it's hard to be a jack wagon when you're a praying person. You're actually going to find your words change when you're 
continuing steadfastly in prayer. So it says continuing steadfastly in prayer. That's the devotion. Then it says being watchful or alert. Prayer should be our default, right? And a mental alertness. And even like even last night when we all saw the news, uh, the attempted assassination of former President Trump, um, I, I tweeted, I'm not going to share, the, I said, I'm not going to share the video, but I'm going to which is right at the beginning, but I'm just going to pray right now for the former president, and I'm going to pray for our country. Because uh, again, I want, that, I want that to be my first reaction. It isn't always my first reaction, but when it's our first reaction, then what happens is the Spirit of God is working in us, and we are more wise in what we say. We are more wise in what we say. So it starts with devotion, continue steadfastly, and it says being watchful, which is alertness, always looking for the opportunity. Then it says with gratitude, be watchful in it with gratitude thanksgiving. Paul literally says to be watchful in it with thanksgiving. You say, Ed, how I will be thankful in difficult times, right? So because the whole title of my message is communicating good news in bad times. Paul's in prison. Paul's in prison. The Christian church is often being persecuted. He says, being watchful in prayer with thanksgiving. So there's something there for us that gratitude really, really makes a difference. So yes, I've, I've been town. I've been in town for about four or five days doing, doing some meetings. I I, I um, had some meetings at Wheaton College, and then I had some meetings downtown. And the meeting downtown ended yesterday around noon. It was a group of Christian leaders who were working on a kind of a plan. And um, one of them is a name of an author that you may have read. Her name's Anne Voskamp. I don't know if anyone's read Anne, but uh, she she wrote in her book. I told her I was going to share this with you. Uh, she wrote in her book, The Broken Way how New Testament Greek words kind of help us to understand more about gratitude and the Christian life. Here's what she talked about. She talked about the Greek word for gratitude, which is eucharisteo, which if you listen closely, eucharist, you've heard the word eucharist, like communion, Lord's Supper. So the Greek word uh, for eucharisteo, uh, grace, which is charis, is the Greek word for charis, and joy, which is chera, they all sound similar because they come from the same root word. So let me just quote from her book, The Broken Way, which I'd commend to you if you haven't read it. She said, I read it first, excuse me, I had first read it slowly years ago, how in the original language, gave thanks, reads Eucharisteo. The root word of Eucharisteo is charis, meaning grace. Jesus took the bread and saw it as grace and gave thanks. There was more, she writes. Eucharisteo, thanksgiving, also holds the Greek word chera meaning joy, joy. And what was, and, and that was what the quest for more, more things, I want more and more and more and more, the quest for more has always been about, in which St. Augustine claimed, without exception, all try their hardest to reach the same goal, that is joy. She later wrote that she learned, quote, so then as long as thanks was possible, then joy was also possible. The holy grail of joy was not in some exotic location or some emotional mountain peak experience. The joy wonder could be here in the messy, piercing ache of the now. The only place we need to see before we die is the place of seeing God here and now. So that gratitude really begins to shape us and it'll impact the way we speak to God and speak to others. So my first point is speak to God with gratitude, but the beauty of that gratitude is based and connected deeply to how we pray. So I've been traveling um, a lot the last two months. I've been in uh, different, I just came back from Korea last week, uh, but in uh, late May and early June, I was teaching uh, a class at Oxford, and then I, I flew down to speak at a conference in Poland. And when I was in Poland, I was in Wisla, Poland. And some of you know that Wisla, Poland, because some of you are from Eastern Europe. We have a, a disproportionate number, a surprising number of people in our church who are from Ukrainian and Russian backgrounds, right? Some of you will wear headphones for translation and more. So you know there's a surprising number of Ukrainian and Russian people here at High Point Church. So when I was in Wisla, I, I, you can't legally go to Ukraine right now. And so I could not ask for permission of my president, the president of Biola University, or my provost, or the lawyers, or the head of security at Biola to go to Ukraine. However, uh, the Talbot School of Theology, we have an extension center in Kyiv. We've had an extension center in Kyiv for over a decade. So we have students there. I have dozens of students 
studying to be pastors and counselors in Kyiv in Ukraine. So I did what I would tell my children not to do. I decided to ask forgiveness rather than permission. I got a friend to, uh, who was from Kyiv to uh, drive me and sneak me across the border. And uh, early, last month I was, in the, I was in Kyiv, Ukraine. So some of you who are from Ukraine, I came across Lviv, drove down eventually, I think it's M40 into Kyiv, uh, through the M40, the highway where so much of the war took place, past the Irpine River and more. And, uh, and I will tell you, it was, it was very uh, it's a challenging time. I mean, everybody is feeling the way. Everyone knows somebody who died. You go down to Independence Square, and you can see flags for each of those people who have died in the war. I stopped uh, at the Battle of the European River, saw that. If you follow me on social media, I shared a lot of this. I wanted people to pray for our Ukrainian friends and believers. And the Ukrainian people are robust. Uh, I will tell you, the way they face the ongoing bombardment is pretty... Uh, stalwart. Uh, every, every night we were there, the air raid sirens went off. Um, uh, and they have apps for these things also. And one night was one of the biggest bombardments in uh, a year, is that there were over 100 missiles and drones. So we heard the interceptors and we heard some explosions in Kyiv where, where I was. And so I was just, so we, had a, we gathered together some of our pastors and our students and our leaders who were there. Some have already been sent to the front, some connected to Kyiv Theological Seminary, had, some have already lost their lives. Um, like I said, um, everybody knows somebody. We, one of the things they asked us about is, is they are starting a lot of ministries for young widows and churches. All these things are just sobering and deeply sad. It is a, uh, it is a war that we haven't thought this way in a very long time, uh, where hundreds of people every day are dying at the front in a country that's much smaller than ours, so per capita, much more, uh, many more people are losing their lives. So, uh, but that Sunday, went to ch- I went to church. And I always love to be and share the gospel at a church. And they sang, and they sang, they sang songs of gratitude and of praise. That very service, we sent somebody off who had been conscripted into the army. He was about to go off. We prayed for him. We prayed for one family that were going to join the rest of their family who were refugees outside of the country. And of course, if you go in Poland, you've got all kinds of refugees and resettled there. And we prayed, and some people wept. And, and, but what I want you to hear is, is that in the midst of all of that difficulty, they kept speaking to God of his grace, his strength, and their need for his love, but also a gratitude that he was with them in the difficult and the dark times. And I was struck by the fact that, yeah, we're right now, I, you know, we're in some very divided times, some very difficult times as a nation. And I will tell you, the assumption in Europe is that this is going to get worse. You know, people feel this. I said, I was just in Korea, the assumption in there, things are going to get worse. The world is on edge, but it's a reminder for us in this time that one thing we can do, it's not the only thing we should do, but one thing we can do is continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving, and to speak to God with gratitude. And if people at a church in Ukraine can do that between bombardment, we lost power during the service, generators were running and more, we were praying for people who were in harm's way. If they can do that, so can we. You say, you don't know, it's just so frustrating on social media. I, I know. But Speak to God with gratitude in these times. Man, it's hard to be grumpy when you're grateful. And when you live 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing, it says. Pray without ceasing. When you live those truths, let's put up first, here we go, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it shapes us. And I just think that that's a good reminder and what we hope is a summer of rest, which is going to be a fall of a lot of probably division and more, is to pray without ceasing. But that leads to number two on our outline. Number two is to, is to pray for believers to focus, is to pray for believers. So, so we pray to God. We also pray for believers. Look at what it says in Colossians chapter 4, beginning at verse 3. It says, at the same time, pray also for us. Paul's talking about himself and these Christians who are with him, that God may open to us a door for the word. Listen to their focus, because <laughs> I don't want you to miss this, right? Pray for, open, for God open for us a door for the word to declare the mystery on the account of whom I am in prison. So don't miss this. He says, pray that God will open a door while he's in prison. Maybe I'm less mature, but if I'm in prison unjustly, my letter might say, pray for me to get out. Don't you think? His is pray for us to clearly communicate the gospel while we're in prison. 
Now, I'm still praying for, I was praying for the war to end in Ukraine, and I'm praying for our nation, just as our pastor did. I'm praying for our nation to, to move past this time of great division and more. But this is a great time for us also to pray for one another. Pray for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak, and that's for you and for me. It's imitation here, right? Not, we don't need to be, Westboro, terrible example. Paul, good example. He says, in these times when I'm in prison, Christians often persecuted, help me to make it clear, which is now how I ought to speak. And that's my prayer for you and for me right now in 2024, a divided and broken year, and in 2025 and beyond, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. I think that's key for us. He focuses on communicating the gospel, the mystery of Christ. He he talks about opportunity. Pray for open doors. As the Spirit leads, we will speak. I actually pray in my quiet time. I say, Lord, give me the privilege to share the gospel with somebody once a week. And so often he does because I'm praying for open doors. He says, pray for clarity that I may speak the mystery of Christ, that I may make it known as I should. Sisters and brothers, in broken and divided time, we are still ambassadors for Christ, citizens of a different kingdom, messengers of the good news, that's our focus. Stay on point with our, with our calling. We want to show the good news of the Lord with our lives, but Paul also is telling us to share the good news with our lips. And a lot of what this boils down to about focus is saying the right things and not saying the wrong things. And I want you not to miss this. The Bible has a lot to say about how we speak and use our words. Now, I'm about to go rapid fire, right? This is a little lightning round, and I'm going to give you six verses about the proper use of words, sometimes from Proverbs who talk about how foolish people don't rightly use their words. Now, I'm going to go through these six verses rapid fire. I'm going to ask you to do one thing, not to look at anybody else, not to hear me say that and go look over at your husband, not to think about your friend not to poke somebody next to you, for us just to focus on the verses and ask, well, what does this mean for me? What's the Lord got for me in this? Let's look at six verses that talk about how we use our words wisely. One of them is Proverbs 10, 19. It says this, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. That's a hard one to hear for some of us, particularly extroverts like me. My wife's an introvert, and being an introvert's never having to say you're sorry for something you shouldn't have said. Well, that's not true either. She would take these verses to heart too. Proverbs 12, 18, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Just not miss that. That could be you too. It's me sometimes. Or Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away anger, but a harsh word stirs up anger. There's a good word for the rest of this year and into next year. Or Proverbs chapter 17, verse 27, whoever restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. You say, Ed, but I'm Irish. Ethnicity does not exempt you from the teachings of the word of God, and I'm Irish too. So we can't take it. We have to say these apply to us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, Christ. Or one more. It's like, no, please, no more. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 19, know this, my beloved brothers and sisters, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Focus. Pray for believers to focus. Paul says, pray for us that we might focus rightly in these times, even when I'm in prison. And 2,000 years later, I say, let's pray for one another that we may use right, winsome words, even about difficult issues in the day, to speak with them with grace and love and care and truth. Paul literally says, make it known as I should. He prays for consistency, even when I'm in chains. This is a key thing. He says, pray even when I'm in chains. Why would he say such a thing? Because in all circumstances, we're supposed to make sure and pray for one another that we would speak well in these times. He says elsewhere, Ephesians 6.20, he says, for which I am an ambassador in chains. And he says, pray that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now, maybe for you, you're not good with words, okay? Pray for personal activity, that I may make it known as I should. 
See, God's given each of us a personality and abilities and gifts, and just as he gave Paul. So each of us can actually make this a request that will personally make the gospel known, personally make the gospel known as God has crafted us to share. Some of you love hospitality. Use your home. Some of you are, have intellectual ability. Respond to others. Some of you are gifted with compassion. Show empathy. But we're showing this. We're demonstrating this. We're praying for believers to focus and live like this because as D.L. Moody puts it, out of 100 men, one will read the Bible, the other 99 will read the Christian. And I'm just asking in 2024 and 2025 that when they read you, they'll see your life as something that represents Jesus and his kingdom well. Number three, you know, we're running out of time. Did you guys like shorten the sermons since I've been gone? It seems like I, got, I should have more time. All right, quit complaining, Ed. Number three, speak to others by our actions. I use the air quotes, right? Speak to others by action. This is like wisdom and living with good stewardship of our lives. It says this in Colossians 4 or 5. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. And we know we should. We don't like it when some Christian keeps talking about Jesus and lives badly. We don't like that. We think we know that's wrong. That's hypocritical. And so some, there's even a famous quote. Matter of fact, I typed in, I use chat GPT. I'm trying to use AI more. I'm, I'm, leading, I'm part of a leading an initiative called AI in the church, you know, helping use artificial intelligence in smart, godly, ethical, and appropriate ways. So in preparation for this message, I typed into chat GPT. I, I, said, I said this, I said, what are famous quotes of Francis Assisi? I should have said Francis of Assisi, but you see my error right here. But chat GPT was smart enough to know who I meant. It said, Francis of Assisi, the founder of the Franciscan order, kind of explained about Francis, gave this one quote, start by doing what's necessary, then what's possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. And then it gave this other quote, preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. Man, I've seen that on Facebook a hundred times. I've seen people put it on Twitter. They even explained the quote. And there were a bunch of other quotes beyond this one, but it said, this quote emphasizes the importance of living out the gospel through Actions. Now, here's why I showed you this. First of all, uh, this is not anything that Francis ever said. So I'm just illustrating to you, don't believe AI. It's, it, it's wrong all the time, and eventually it's going to kill us all. But that's another story for another day. And here I am helping to lead an initiative to use it ethically and wisely. But why, do people, why are people drawn to this quote? And here's where it's wrong, by the way. It's that we, preaching requires words. We proclaim the gospel with words. We demonstrate the gospel with deeds. Let me say it again so you don't miss it. We proclaim the gospel with words. So he says, pre I mean, the, the fake quote is preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. It's a lot like saying feed the hungry at all times when necessary, use food. When it comes to preaching the gospel, it's necessary to use words. And we just talked about words in the point prior. So preach the gospel, right? Great. But here what we would say better, because proclaiming the gospel is with words, demonstrating the gospel is with deeds. Remember, the gospel is not what you do. The gospel is what Jesus did. But we demonstrate the gospel with loving actions. So our actions speak to others. Hence point three is speak to others by our actions. So it's literally... In, in wisdom be walking. So we're walking wisely towards outsiders. And this is something that we see throughout the pages of scripture. Jesus in Matthew 5, 16 puts it this way. He says in the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your father who's in heaven. And then it also says in this passage, right? Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. And here's the deal. I, I, we didn't pick the time in which we live. And so I'm, this is a hard time. 2024 is a divided, hard time. We feel that. Of course, we have sisters and brothers in Ukraine are going through a much harder time. And we in our church and others help support them as well. So we know that that's the case. So we don't get to pick the time. However, we do pick how we live in the times. And I want to ask you in 2024 and beyond to, to make your life count as one whose actions are showing and sharing the love of Jesus. First Peter puts it this way, keep your conduct among the Gentiles. And by Gentiles, Peter's writing to Jewish Christians, so he's basically meaning non-believers. Keep your conduct among non-believers honorable. So what you do at work and how you relate to others and how you are financially faithful in your tasks at work and, and how, you, how, you, how you work in your family and how you engage your neighbors, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Listen, don't want you to miss, miss this, right? 
Dietrich Bonhoeffer puts it this way, and I want to put it this way before you. Your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. I think that's a good reminder for us, right? I had someone recently walk up to me and say, uh, I have an MBA in business, and I really love the Lord, and I'm wondering if I should become a pastor. What's your advice? And of course, I didn't know this person. It wasn't in my church. And I said, first of all, I think most Christians at some point have a question. Should I go into ministry? I think it's a good thing. Maybe not everybody, but a lot of people do. And what I would say to you, if you, if you cannot go into ministry, you probably shouldn't. It has to be just a clear call that I've got to do this. Because I just, can I tell you, we need more godly bankers and truck drivers and factory workers and nurses. And, because then people can see. They can see keeping conduct honorable. And, and even if they speak against you, they, they see the reality of your life in Christ. Number four. Proclaim. Remember, we're going to demonstrate. Now we're going to proclaim. Proclaim with winsome, Christ-like, winsome engagement. Now, these are, these are just the words of Scripture. These are not Ed's words. This is not Ed's advice at this point. Let's look at Colossians 4.6. Let your speech, and that speech includes how we relate to others. In some ways, it includes our actions. It includes what we type on the Internet, whatever it may be. Let your speech always be gracious. Did it say sometimes be gracious, well, except, in a, except in a political year or, or except in the middle of a war or except in the middle of a difficult time or persecution? No, it says let your speech always be gracious. Would you say always with me? Let's do it. Always. Let your speech always be gracious. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so you may know how you ought to answer each person. So Paul already asked for prayer for his speech. Now he calls us to speak well for Christ. And we see that throughout the pages of Scripture. We need to tell people using speech. And that matters. It's, it's um, gracious speech, right? Speech that, and that's part of where our focus comes in. And if you say something about everything, then when you say something about the important things, people have already seen you say something else about everything. But it's a gratifying speech. It's seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt. So people are drawn to it. Now, the way we speak is a recurring theme in Scripture. Look at Ephesians 4.29. It says, let no corrupting talk. And sometimes we see that verse and we think it means like profanity. And it does. I mean, it does relate to that. But it says, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So, Fred Phelps, who lead the non-Westboro, non-Baptist, non-church, he died and not... I mean, maybe, I remember how many years ago I was, I was living in uh, Nashville at the time, so at least maybe eight or nine years ago. And I wrote an article about our interaction and about the family and in some ways what I prayed for their repentance and also the damage that they would cause. And an email showed up in my inbox from a member of the family. And I was quite surprised. It was the son of Fred Phelps, whose father had just died. And he wrote to me, I am so thankful for the truthful words you wrote in your article. And I, and I said, what in the world? And I, I, I said, you want to talk some more? And I, I, we talked a little more. And I said, you want me to actually interview you, tell your story? And, and one of the things he said in there was this. He said, if I had to take my family to court, and you have to remember, they're all lawyers, right? So if I had to take my family to court and convict them for being followers of Christ, I'm not sure where I could find the evidence, unquote. I mean, that's a jarring thing, but can I tell you, Mark, actually, he got out of that unhealthy, traumatic place. He, he met Jesus. He was, he was baptized into a church in Phoenix and a follower of Jesus now. And I got to tell you, you might not. Westboro is, of course, the worst example, so it's very easy for us to say, well, I'm not like that. But I, I wonder if Mark's words might still be applicable for you to consider just a moment on your social media or your interactions with your neighbors or your family members. Or, he said, if I had to take my family to court and convict them for being followers of Christ, I'm not sure where I could find the evidence. So let's not make it so easy to contrast in the worst, but instead ask, how might we do better? So maybe even in this time, in this message, you've been like, you know, I really got to work on some of the things I say or some of the things I post. And uh, I asked Mark, what's your hope and your prayer for your family? He said he prayed for them. And here's what he said. The Lord is able, and I put my trust in him always. 
So maybe you're hearing this message and you're saying, I'm Irish. I don't know if I can do that. Or I grew up in a family where we just blurt at each other and we say things and people just have to get used to it and me. And Can I say to you, if Mark Phelps can say of his family, the non-Westboro, non-Baptist, non-church, the Lord is able and I put my trust in him always, you can say that too. The Lord is able to tame the tongue and you can put your trust in him also. So as we talk to people, I'll close with this. We're trying to win people to Jesus, not an argument. That's not our focus. Doesn't mean we don't speak truth, but our focus is to point people to Jesus, to show Christ's love in a, in a hurting world, not score points against people with whom we disagree. And we can still disagree. It's a question of how we're showing and sharing the love of Jesus. You saw the passages. This is not Ed Stetzer's advice. These are Bible verses to speak truth and hospitality and grace, not like hammering a nail. To display wisdom, don't always feel you need to be the wise guy. To manifest good news, not trying to destroy other people, their character with our words. So my exhortation to you is really quite simple right now. Is The title of the message is the theme. Let's communicate good news in bad times. Let's be people in a summer of rest and a year of division, maybe in a season the division is going to get worse before it gets better and people around the world think it's going to get worse around the world. Let's be people who choose to communicate by our words and our deeds good news even in the midst of bad times. Would you pray with me? Let's go before the Lord and pray together. Father, we acknowledge today by your grace and your goodness you've redeemed us and called us by name and sent us on mission for your namesake. And we want to build our life on that. We want to build our life on that truth. And there's a reason there are so many Bible verses about how we use words. Or would you speak to me personally and every person here personally about how we should respond to this message today? Because there's no one like you. There's none beside you. As you open our eyes in wonder, but Lord... We want to build our life on the firm foundation and let our words be reflective of that foundation. Lord, help us to communicate good news in bad times, to put our trust in you alone and not be shaken. That's our prayer as we continue to worship today. Speak to our hearts, speak to my heart as well, Lord Jesus. Just in the same spirit of prayer you're in right now, would you stand with me? Let's stand together. And let's sing this song. He's, there's no one like you, Lord. There's none beside you. Open my eyes and wonder. I will build my life upon your love. Let's worship together. <laughs>